So it's a great uh, honor and privilege to introduce uh, uh, our associate, Dr. Uh, Ted Cho, uh, who's going to be talking about vestibular migraine, uh, differentiating it from Meniere's disease and persistent postural perceptional dizziness. So Ted, thank you for uh, taking care of all of our patients, but also for enlightening us this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Today I'll be talking about uh, vestibular migraine, but specifically giving it a little bit of a uh, uh, comparison contrast to some other common types of dizziness entities that you see, that one might see, Meniere's disease and this condition called 3PD or persistent postural perceptual dizziness. And through this talk, you'll probably get a little bit of a flavor of what you may see in a vestibular clinic, what I definitely particularly see in my clinic. So I have no disclosures. So I just wanted to start off to underscore the importance of this condition called vestibular migraine. Um, it's a very common cause. Well, it's actually the most common cause of central recurrent attacks of vertigo. It's only secondary to BPPV in terms of uh, commonality of triggering vertigo. And it's estimated that the female to male ratio is as high as five to one. Um, thought to be secondary to a uh, hormonal component in, in migraine symptoms in general. It can also be a very challenging diagnosis. Challenging um, because there are many neurotologic comorbidities with migraine headaches in general. Uh, migraines are more commonly associated with things like BPPV, Meniere's disease, motion sickness, and then 3PD as well. It's also challenging to, to manage many patients with vestibular migraine. When I look at my own practice, I, I think of the patients that are most challenging, and those are ones who have concurrent issues, who have vestibular migraine, in addition to concurrent Meniere's disease, concurrent 3PD, where they have constant underlying dizziness symptoms, something called visual dependence that we'll discuss in more detail, and also significant anxiety and other mood disorders. So in this talk, what we'll be focusing on is three main topics. Number one, I'll be going over a review of vestibular migraine, the diagnosis, management, and some of the treatment options that, that I found to be successful. Uh, secondly, I'll be talking about what differentiates vestibular migraine from Meniere's disease. And then thirdly, talking about what differentiates vestibular migraine from persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which is, it's, it's a relatively new diagnosis in terms of the name, but the concept has been around since the uh, 19th century. So vestibular migraine. So anytime you talk about vestibular migraine or even migraines in general, including migraine headaches and optic migraine, you have to talk about the trigeminal vascular system, which you know, basically starts with the trigeminal nucleus and all the nerve endings that provide sensation to various parts of the face and head. And the underlying mechanism of just general migraine is activation of this trigeminal vascular system, uh, essentially inflammation, neurovascular inflammation. One of the mechanisms is a release of vasoactive neuropeptides, such as those listed here, which basically cause inflammation, which is vasodilation, plasma protein extravasation, mast cell degranulation. Usually when I talk to my patients and counsel them, I, I tell them that there are three different types of inflammation. There's, uh, uh, you know, most simply put, there's infection inflammation, as you might get with sinusitis. There's allergy inflammation, usually from an antigen you're exposed to. And then there's migraine mechanism, which would be a class of inflammation considered sterile inflammation because there is no antigen or bacteria. You know, in many ways, migraine is very relevant for sinus practices as well, because a lot of facial pain, atypical facial pain, it's estimated a large percentage of that is actually migraine rather than sinusitis. 
So in terms of migraine, it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis. There are no lab tests, no imaging that diagnose it. And the International Classification of Headache Disorders has a criteria, which uh, basically I, I remember by five, four, two, one, uh, there's no three. So basically you need to have at least five attacks in your life of these sorts of headaches. So, so this is actually headaches I'm talking about initially. The headaches last four to 72 hours, five, four. You have to have two of the following, which is a headache with a unilateral location or pulsating quality or moderate or severe pain intensity or affecting routine physical activity. And then one of the following, which is nausea and or vomiting um, or photophobia and phonophobia. Now, when I tell some of my patients that they're having migraines, vestibular migraine, or that even some of their headaches fit migraine criteria, you know, many of them are say, oh, no, my, my headaches aren't migraines. I've seen people with one-sided headaches going into dark rooms, extreme pain. But if actually you, you look at this criteria, more headaches would fit under the migraine criteria if you use some of the other points. So you have to have at least five headaches. You know, everyone has had five headaches in their lifetime. Headaches have to last more than four hours. I mean, I'm sure most people have had headaches that last more than four hours. And then two of the following, how often, I always ask patients, how often are the headaches more than minimal? They're moderate to severe and they affect routine physical activity. Like when you have the headache, you don't want to work around the house, walk outside. And then how often is a headache associated with nausea? I think when you use some of these criteria, you find that um, that there can be that that more headaches have what what would be considered what would be considered migraines or have migraineous qualities. So now we kind of transition over to vestibular migraine, and I usually tell my patients that vestibular migraine is probably more comparable to optic migraine than actual migraine headaches, that it's a migraine type mechanism that affects a, another sensory portion of the brain. Uh, in vestibular migraine's case, that, that affects the, the balance system. So one of the mechanisms is thought to be that this vestibular migraine, uh, uh, the, the trigeminal area that's affected is this ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve because this this ophthalmic branch is found to innervate the inner ear via the basilar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, uh, also innervates the cochlear nucleus. And this is basically a schematic where once this trigeminal, uh, this um, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and associated branches is affected, then there is neurogenic inflammation where the blood vessels cause dilation, inflammation, and you can basically see the, the distribution of where the, the blood vessels would be and the anterior, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the vascular artery. This is another schematic um, from a, a neurology journal that, that shows a, a potential mechanism that this trigeminovascular reflex is activated, the whole pain pathway, vasodilation of inner ear blood vessels, cochlear vestibular hyposensitivity, vestibular dysfunction, because some patients during an attack may not have any nystagmus, but many individuals in a vestibular migraine attack can actually have central appearing nystagmus. The relationship between migraine and vertigo is not new. Uh, as far back as 1873 in this particular treatise by Edward Living, who was a, a British neurologist, found that um, there's an association between migraine and, and some other conditions in which he, he talks about vertigo as well. Vertigo is, is common in, in migraine in general. Um, one epidemiologic study way back found that up to 27% of migraine sufferers complain of some form of vertigo. Maybe not vestibular migraine per se, as that has a very specific criteria, but just vertigo dizziness in general. A German study found that the lifetime prevalence of vestibular migraine is 1% in their particular population. And it's estimated that the vestibular migraine prevalence in a dizziness clinic may be as high as 
maybe even more, it just depends on your referral base, but less than 2% of the referring MDs may suspect that. And, and I can say that, that over time, that percentage has increased as there's been increased awareness of vestibular migraine, but it is, it is still a very underdiagnosed condition. As far as um, the, the typical type of patient vignette you may hear about, it, it would be somebody who has episodic severe vertigo lasting for hours with head fullness. There could be some sensory distortions such as tilting, uh, young, otherwise healthy female woman. Um, and um, uh, as far as, the, I mean, there is a clear hormonal contribution with migraines in general. And then usually normal, normal testing, MRIs, audiograms, uh, many of these patients are diagnosed with Meniere's disease, but those treatments can be ineffective. And if someone has a past history of migraine headaches, they, they would at least fit into the, the category of probable vestibular migraine. There is actually a vestibular migraine criteria that was uh, put forth by the Baronet Society in 2012, Baronet Society being an international board that focuses on of vestibular imbalance disorders. And it's being integrated into the newest edition of the International Classification of Headache Disorders. And so basically it, it, it really does follow the, the criteria for migraine headaches, at least five episodes of vestibular symptoms in general, current or previous history of migraine, and then one or more migraine features with at least 50% of vestibular episodes. And so, um, Basically, if you look at these criteria here, these are the criteria for uh, migraine headaches, that you have a headache with at least two of the following characteristics, one-sided location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe pain intensity, aggravation by routine physical activity, photophobia and phonophobia, visual aura. Um, I noticed whoever joined on recently, your microphone is on, and so there's a little bit of feedback. I just asked whoever joined on, or, or maybe Laura can, can mute, or Bill can mute everyone's microphones. Um, as far as migraine triggers, now we're starting to get into the, the diagnosis. Whenever I have a patient where I'm suspecting vestibular migraine, I, I ask them for particular triggers, summarize the stress, hormonal triggers, sleep, weather triggers, um, sensory type of triggers, dietary triggers. Stress definitely plays a role. In, I can't tell you how often a patient starts presenting with vertigo after some sort of stressor, whether it's psychological, physical, health type of issue, myocardial infarction, viral event, hormonal changes. I definitely ask women about menstrual cycle and how often that may be associated with symptoms. Another particular situation would be an individual who is changing their oral contraceptive and noticing an onset of symptoms. Changes in sleep. And it even goes beyond sleep deprivation if there's too much sleep, such as sleeping, on, sleeping in on the weekends or a shifting sleep schedule. An individual who, who maybe has a, a job where they're, they're changing sleep schedule throughout the week. I've definitely seen that. Intense stimulations lighting, sound, visual stimulation for triggers. Those are pretty um, key clues that this may be vestibular migraine that you're dealing with. And then dietary, things like skipping meals and then certain food triggers. And, and this is where we start transitioning into treatment for vestibular migraine. And the types of foods I look at are ones that may be aged or have some characteristics that make them precursors for neurotransmitters. So with vestibular migraine, diet is always an important thing to, to focus on. I, I always focus on the basics, conservative measures that can help symptoms. It's, it's really amazing to me how many patients have seen neurologists or other physicians and are started off with a medication when something like diet supplements can be very effective. And, and I've actually seen many patients where just the diet itself resolves their issues. And they ask me, why didn't these other physicians talk to me about diet? And so basically when you think about diet, you think about 
foods that are neurotransmitter precursors, foods that are high in tyramine, such as aged cheeses, nuts, foods that are high in glutamate, such as MSG, very clear trigger for migraine headaches in a lot of individuals, or substances that are vasoconstrictors, things like caffeine, afrin, Sudafed. So this is a, a kind of a, a copy of the migraine diet that I give patients. It's a diet that I, I that, that at House Clinic we use. Um, I've developed based on some other resources um, uh, that, that to, to put this together. And basically, I've, I've divided this diet for patients in two main categories. At the top, from caffeine to alcohol, red wine, I, I usually consider those the stronger triggers. The ones at the bottom, I just roughly lump into foods high in tyramine. Those tend to be more hit and miss. I usually put patients on this diet for a minimum of two months and ask them to be fairly strict with it. But when they start reincorporating foods, I tell them to start from the bottom up. And usually caffeine is one of the last things that you reincorporate because rebound headaches, rebound migraines, rebound vertigo symptoms are, are usually the, the uh, most likely trigger for symptoms. Another resource that, that uh, I, I usually point patients to is this website called the Dizzy Cook. Um, the Dizzy Cook is actually an individual in, in Texas who has vestibular migraine. She has a website with recipes, and I, I particularly like it because she has resources where she talks about foods that are allowed because patients often have specific questions about foods that are not on my list, and I find that she's an invaluable resource. Supplements are also very important, and, and many of these have been tried and uh, tested in clinical trials, including magnesium, um, and the form I like to use is magnesium glycinate because it is one of the more hi highly bioavailable forms, about four to 600 milligrams a day. One of the mechanisms is thought to be smooth muscle relaxation of blood vessels, uh, blood vessel smooth muscle, riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, both assisting in, in nerve cell uh, energy metabolism. Now, if diet medications uh, don't work, and I usually see patients back after a month or two, then you go the next uh, step up, which is medications. And medications roughly fall into three categories. They include things like antidepressants, anticonvulsants, and antihypertensives. Uh, probably the most common medications I use are nortriptyline, Effexor, and then Topamax, Topiramate, which is in the next slide. So nortriptyline, 10 to 50, 50 milligrams at night, most common side effects being dry mouth, sedation, constipation. I tend to like it, I like to use it when there is concurrent neuromuscular pain, neck pain, cervicogenic dizziness symptoms. I find that it tends to be very successful and helpful in those sorts of situations. If Exer extended release venlafaxine is also what it's called, 37.5 milligrams. It's considered a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, I have people build up slowly. So, so I, I use a protocol that, that I call microdosing, where basically they take the capsule they open up the capsule and there are time release granules. Usually these granules are very good size. I have them open up the capsule. Usually there's about 40 to 60 granules, depending on the generic. I have them start with two of the granules and then slowly scale up uh, like four of the following week. And I always emphasize to take it in the capsule because I feel like that really, that, that allows the time release mechanism to work appropriately because immediate release uh, venlafaxine tends to, uh, it's too much of a, a dosage of medication all at once. And I tend to use Effexor when there is more of a sensory amplification component, kind of visual sensory overload, visual dependence type of symptom. And, it, and it's very successful for that. Anticonvulsants, another broad category. One of the ones that I focus on is Topamax, Topiramate, there can be a variety of issues, weight loss, word finding difficulties, tingling of the hands and feet, uh, contraindicated in individuals with glaucoma. I, I tend to use this when there is more of a clear cut migraine headache component to the dizziness symptoms. 
and then antihypertensives. I don't tend to use these as often, but I, 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 um, I, I think neurologists tend to like verapamil, calcium channel blocker, 50% um, of constipation, beta blocker, propranolol, unclear mechanism. Another resource is this particular book called Feel Your Headache. It's an older book by a neurologist named David Buckholz, who was at Johns Hopkins. Um, really very readable, goes through a one, two, three step plan, talks really uh, talks about in layman's terms the underlying mechanism of migraine and even goes beyond headache. It talks about vertigo, dizziness, facial pain symptoms, really very helpful resource. So, um, so that, that basically summarizes uh, or that ends my um, portion of vestibular migraine. So I'm going to transition into um, comparison and contrast. Differentiating vestibular migraine from Meniere's disease as the second part of the talk. So Meniere's disease, uh, uh, first identified by a gentleman named Prosper Meniere, 1861. And uh, interestingly, in his original treatise, he possibly made a connection with migraine as well, even as far back as then. I'm not going to go in depth in terms of the mechanism of Meniere's disease or the treatment, but just you know briefly to say um, in histopathology, when individuals donate their temporal bones to science, when you look under um, um, uh, high resolution, you see that there is damage to the inner ear, basically dilation to uh, saccule uh, <coughs> and and uh, inside the labyrinth as well. So. Once again, Meniere's disease is, is diagnosed based on clinical criteria. There really isn't any definitive test that, that would be the gold standard for diagnosis. I know that there are MRIs out there where you can see evidence of high drops, but even evidence of high drops itself doesn't definitively diagnose Meniere's disease. While most people with Meniere's, or probably all of them, will have high drops uh, swelling inside the inner ear, histologic evidence of high drops or MRI evidence of high drops. Just because you have high drops doesn't necessarily mean that you would have had a clinical history of Meniere's disease. And so the criteria for Meniere's disease was updated in 2015, probably to accommodate vestibular migraine, but it follows a lot of very similar criteria. But once again, it's a clinical diagnosis four more spontaneous episodes of vertigo lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours. This 12 hour limit has been added to the Meniere's criteria just because vestibular migraine tends to last longer than, than 12 hours or, or can last longer than 12 hours. You need audiometrically documented hearing loss, but in this particular criteria, the updated criteria, they specify the hearing loss in the low to medium frequencies. They even specified that the thresholds must be at least 30 decibels worse in the affected ear at two contiguous frequencies below 2000 Hertz. And they outlined some specific criteria for bilateral Meniere's disease. And then you have similar to the 95 criteria fluctuating oral symptoms as listed here in the affected ear and then other causes excluded as is most of the, the other sort of criteria that, that we use. As far as what, what causes Meniere's disease, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, a mixed basket. Uh, there's a lot of theories that there's genetic predisposition, infection in, in some situations, vascular, migraine triggers, Meniere's trauma, but all these entities cause this final endpoint of high drops, which then um, results in situations such as episodic vertigo, fluctuating hearing loss, basically, the symptoms of full Meniere's disease. What is the best treatment? Well, this is a, a slide from, I guess, an old slide used by House Clinic that I, that I took from one of the other talks. It's like a witch's brew, you know, maybe a little bit of diazide uh, here, maybe uh, beta histine, um, low salt. Uh, not not all Meniere's patients are low are salt sensitive, but some are. You know, it's it's that. There recently have been guidelines that have been put out by the uh, 
the academy, but um, you know, there's still some controversy as far as how to, what is the best treatment for Meniere's disease. So this is a particular case study that is relevant to Meniere's disease vestibular migraine. So a patient named JS, who was a 59-year-old gentleman who presented in 2004, really no significant past medical history, was having tinnitus for eight years, dizziness for, for um, four to five months, uh, fullness in the right ear preceding the dizziness, with essentially normal testing. This is his audiogram. It was normal. He was empirically treated with diazide, possibly thought to have Meniere's disease. Five years later, um, he was having yearly vertigo attacks, and his, his audiogram started to show right asymmetric sensory hearing, sensory neural hearing loss. So definitely meeting the criteria for Meniere's disease. Then in 2010, he had a, a heart attack. His audiogram continued to worsen. Vertigo became more frequent and didn't benefit from intratympanic dexamethasone to the, the right ear. Then in 2013 is when, when I saw him. Um, that, that's when I joined the, the house clinic. And um, he was having vertigo with right ear fullness, but then he was also talking about headaches with light sensitivity. And, and he noticed that the triggers for his symptoms included things like visual stimuli, neck movements and manipulation, and certain foods such as wine. Um, still going along the Meniere's disease track, I continued the diazide and I added the beta histine and, pre and gave him a prednisone course. His symptoms were, were refractory to prednisone and the addition of the beta histine. And once again, he was telling me about triggers such as fluorescent lighting. Um, I had sent him to physical therapy at this point and neck manipulation was triggering symptoms. Processed foods could trigger symptoms. And even changes in air pressure traveling up to his mountain cabin to trigger symptoms. And so um, at this point, uh, thinking that there may be some migraine component, I started Topamax along with a migraine diet and vertigo eventually improved and resolved by March of 2014. And he's an individual that, that I'm still seeing who if he's not careful with his diet or if he starts tapering down the Topamax, his attacks still come back. So overall, when, when you look at the epidemiology of many years versus migraine, and, and by this, I mean migraine headaches in general, you see that migraine, uh, specifically migraine headaches, have a very high prevalence in the population, estimated about 14%, versus Meniere's disease has a very small prevalence in the general population, 0.05%. But... Um, Research, epidemiologic research has shown that the lifetime prevalence of migraine symptoms, headache, other types of symptoms is in Meniere's patients is about 56%. So there is some overlap uh, epidemiologically. So when you get to the question of differentiating between Meniere's and vestibular migraine, there are two main questions that, that you have to ask. Number one is how often do Meniere's symptoms, Meniere, how, how often does Meniere's disease have migraine features? And then the flip question, how often does vestibular migraine have Meniere's characteristics, most specifically hearing changes, because that is really one of the characteristic qualities of Meniere's disease. So the first question, Meniere's with migraine features, Retrospective review of patients at the Mayo Clinic who met criteria for Meniere's, vestibular migraine or both. Um, and basically in summary, they found that 28% of patients with Meniere's disease also had vestibular migraine. An additional 31% of patients with Meniere's had migraineous features. So maybe not like full blown vestibular migraine, but they had headaches, photophobia, motion sickness symptoms. So overall, they found if you add up 28 30, plus 31, 59% of patients with Meniere's had migraine type symptoms or migraine risk factors. Now, how often do you see the flip side? Uh, migraine with auditory type symptoms, which you might see in Meniere's disease. Well, 
There's a prospective study done in Europe of patients who met criteria for Meniere's disease, vestibular migraine, but not both. Um, and uh, you can see they just divide patients up into definite vestibular migraine, probable vestibular migraine. That just depends on how many of the, the vestibular migraine um, diagnostic categories uh, you meet uh, based on the earlier slide that I showed. And this is one of their summary uh, tables, basically outlined are, are the hearing type symptoms, tinnitus, hearing loss, fullness of the ear. And in patients with Meniere's disease, as expected, a large portion, not everyone, but a large portion of individuals complained of these uh, uh, issues, probably uh, more than 80%. But if you look at vestibular migraine, you see that there's still, you know, 30 to 40% of individuals who complain of these symptoms. Another retrospective review looked for, uh, of uh, patients looked for individuals who met criteria for vestibular migraine and, and basically followed their audiograms over time. And it showed that 18% of individuals showed sensory neural hearing loss bilaterally involving low frequencies with a follow-up time of, of about nine years. However, the type of hearing loss these individuals had were, were, was different than what you would expect with many years, which most often is unilateral. Basically, <coughs> this would be um, like uh, the, the baseline and dotted line, and then this would be sometime afterwards on average nine years. You can see that it's more of a gradual hearing loss and it, it tends to be bilateral, not really what you would expect to see with Meniere's disease. So even the hearing loss with migraine symptoms appears different than Meniere's disease. So in summary, Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine itself can be present in 28% of patients. Um, Vestibular migraine can have tinnitus, ear fullness, and hearing loss. So you can't rely on those symptoms uh, exclusively to diagnose Meniere's disease. However, hearing loss with vestibular migraine is much milder and mostly bilateral. And so there's a difference in the type of hearing loss that you would see. So going back to the original case study that, that I had uh, started uh, this section with. So this patient, JS, he had definite Meniere's disease. I mean, he had vertigo with oral fullness in the right ear, or, or at least originally, he, he definitely had this. Um, he had a, a significant drop in hearing, word recognition score of 24%. But later on, by the time I saw him, uh, 2013, he developed probable vestibular migraine. Um, you know, probable because he doesn't meet all the criteria. He has vertigo, but no migraine headache history. But he was having these um, non-migrainous headaches with photophobia and greater than 50% of attacks. He had food triggers and he had a response to migraine treatment. So, um, so the final portion of my talk, I'm, I'm going to discuss vestibular migraine and, and this entity called 3PD, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. As I mentioned at the beginning, 3PD is, is, is a relatively newer diagnosis, but the idea of 3PD, the ideas behind it is, is by no means a, a new concept. And so for this third section, um, I'm gonna start off with a, a case study again. 19 year old woman presenting with episodic dizziness, vertigo since childhood, meeting the Baronet Society criteria for definite vestibular migraine, one of the slides I went over earlier. Um, she had five or more episodes of vertigo, had met the international classification of headache disorders criteria for migraine headaches. Greater than 50% of her vertigo attacks were associated with migraine headaches and other causes rolled out through testing. So, 2013 was a good year for her. She played as a soccer goalie, very active. But then 2014 brought on progressively worsening symptoms, worse migraines with episodic vertigo. But then she had some of these additional symptoms in between her episodic attacks. She had constant rocking, tilting imbalance. <coughs> 
she had symptoms of something called visual dependence where couldn't really tolerate going down grocery store aisles, computer screens, and she noticed her symptoms when elevated were better, when lying flat. And um, when I had seen her uh, around 2014, she had concerns about starting college in 2015. So initial treatment, migraine diet, um, effects or XR of amlafaxine, 37.5 milligrams. And at the first follow-up of about six to eight weeks later, migraine headaches had improved. The constant rocking, which was there in between the episodic symptoms had decreased in intensity and her visual sensitivity had improved. Subsequent treatments included increasing the effects or addition of Topamax and, and uh, afterwards the follow-up showed continuing improvement of symptoms less of the visual dependence and she ended up going through college and she's graduating and, and now um, trying to study to, to go to vet school. So this is a particular case of vestibular migraine. However, in between the episodic attacks, there were some underlying symptoms, constant dizziness, visual intolerance to motion and patterns, postural symptoms. Um, it doesn't even have to only be vestibular migraine. It could be a Meniere's patient, a VPPV patient, where there are episodic attacks, but there is some kind of constant underlay of symptoms. And what is this? This underlay of symptoms is something called persistent postural perceptual dizziness, or abbreviated 3PD. So 3PD is, in general, considered a postural dizziness and fluctuating unsteadiness provoked by environmental or social stimuli. Uh, some of the concepts of, three, concepts of 3PD were uh, originally uh, laid out by Brandt and Dietrich, who are German neurologists, 1986, under the criteria of phobic postural vertigo. Staub and Dr. Jeff Staub, uh, psychiatrist at Mayo Clinic and Ruckenstein, um, really first brought some of the major characteristics together in 2004 under the term chronic subjective dizziness. In many ways, the chronic subjective dizziness and 3PD are, are fairly synonymous, although 3PD has some refinements to the diagnosis, so it is still a little bit more different. And then in 2014, this was refined to persistent postural perceptual dizziness and it's thought that um, it'll be part of the ICD-11, although uh, I don't know if that's even come out yet. This, this slide is a little bit old. So as I hinted at earlier, this, issue, this concept of chronic dizziness, space, motion, discomfort, and anxiety is not a new concept at all. As far back as the 1800s, a German neurologist, Carl Westphal, found that there were some patients he saw who had problems in the 19th century town square. 1800s. You know, back then, the town square was where all the commerce occurred. And nowadays, it's on social media or the internet, but um, in the town square, all the markets, the shops, the social interactions, he found that there were individuals <coughs> who had significant difficulty in these sorts of environments. Of course, a lot of his criteria now match or now meet the, uh, the, uh, the characteristics he described are those of people with agoraphobia, but um, he described some of the earliest uh, evidence of chronic dizziness associated with space motion discomfort. So this entity called 3PD, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. I see a lot of patients with this condition, either full blown or with some characteristics of this uh, issue. And I usually break it down to this, three Ps, outline the diagnosis, persistent. Basically, non-vertiginous dizziness. It's not really spinning, it could be rocking, swaying, tilting, or unsteadiness present on most days for three months or longer. Postural, it's usually worse when you're up, moving around. You can usually settle the symptoms down when you're lying back. It may not be totally absent, but you can usually scale the symptoms down if you're recumbent. And then perceptual, really one of the key factors. Uh, basically, this individual has visual symptoms, that's termed visual dependence. 
they rely so much on their visual system for balance that they're susceptible to visual sensory overload, computer screens, grocery store aisles, something like an escalator, just really throwing them off and triggering their attacks. This is from Dr. Staub's, one of his uh, um, uh, review articles on, on 3PD, uh, basically outlining what I just mentioned, um, some of the characteristics. <coughs> As far as triggers for 3PD, um, some of the triggers are, are basically summarized in this uh, pie chart. About 45% are some sort of vestibular event. As high as 35% can be purely psychiatric and 20% are others. And so out of the 45% vestibular, you can see a large percentage, 15 to 20% is vestibular migraine. Um, and then panic attacks and anxiety themselves. I've definitely seen a number of patients where a panic attack actually triggers dizziness, this 3PD entity. And then TBI, dysautonomias. Uh, you know, nowadays with uh, you, you read in the news a lot about uh, post-COVID syndrome and and POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia, which is a dysautonomia. I've seen some of those patients who develop 3PD as well it can be really challenging cases. So this is a schematic that, that outlines what would be considered a potential mechanism for 3PD. So, so um, initially there is some underlying precipitant, whether it's a vestibular crisis, medical event, acute anxiety, and the normal response of the body is acute adaptation. Uh, affecting the visual somatosensory uh, sy system, changing the body's postural control strategies, environmental vigilance. And for most individuals, there's recovery on many different levels. But if an individual has some predisposing factors, such as introverted temperament and pre existing an anxiety, then you can see some uh, and, and um, there's some often behavioral comorbidities, then what ends up happening is there the, there's this perpetuating loop of failure of readaptation where an individual is constantly exposed to these provoking factors, which include upright posture, motion, visual demands, basically the criteria of 3PD. And so because you can't live in a bubble, um, although during the year of COVID, uh, you know, many of us have had to almost live in a bubble, um, you're, you're going to be exposed to some sort of stimuli, driving, using the computer. And so these individuals are constantly provoked and often end up finding themselves in social isolation, increased anxiety, depression. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, there is a, a tie-in between vestibular migraine and 3PD. Uh, 20 to 25% of the, the time um, the uh, 3PD is, is triggered by vestibular migraine. Why might this be? Well, if you think about it, it makes sense because migraines uh, in general are associated with elevated sensory symptoms. More migraine patients tend to have more motion intolerance. These are the patients who have a childhood history of car sickness. Migraine individuals are hypersensitive to sensory stimuli. When during attacks, they get light and sound sensitivity. And epidemiologically, it's been found that individuals with migraines tend to have more anxiety and depression, um, thought to be related to underlying serotonergic dysfunction. That's why um, one of the medications that I find that works very well for 3PD is Effexor, venlafaxine, extended release. I talked about that earlier in the vestibular migraine portion of my talk, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. One of the mechanisms that's been uh, extended is the thought that, that one of the ways it works is by reducing the amygdala's response to threatening stimuli. And there's evidence that some of the second order vestibular neurons are serotonin sensitive. Once again, um, I use a, a micro dosing protocol where I have an individual open up the capsule, slowly build up. And, and it may be related to the fact that, that for many of these patients, 
we're not primarily treating anxiety, depression. We're, we're treating this sensory overload, and it doesn't take a lot to help this symptom. Plus, the other thing is many of these individuals are ultra sensitive to medications and may have had medication failures in the past because dosages have been too high. And there are many cases where, where I go back and start with micro, micro doses, pediatric doses of a variety of medications and a patient is better able to tolerate it. Now in the, the final few minutes, I, I, I want to broaden um, the concept of 3PD and, and talk about it in a, in a broader sense as generally what would be considered a functional disorder. And this concept was introduced to me um, at the Baronet meeting in 2015 by Dr. Stopp. He had a little conference where he was talking about 3PD as a functional disorder. This is a website that I, I refer my patients to that talks about different types of functional disorders. So what is a functional medical disorder? So broadly speaking, it's a problem of functioning of the central nervous system, not a structural problem. Most of these individuals will have a normal exam, normal imaging. However, a functional issue would, is not synonymous with an exclusively psychiatric issue. So functional would not be considered a conversion disorder, somatiz somatization, psychogenic, even though that's commonly what functional disorder is thought of. Uh, Dr. Staub was very careful to, to um, outline that this dichotomy between psychiatry and neurology is a, is a false dichotomy in the 20th century, where in actuality, there, there's probably more of a continuum between neurologic and psychiatric issues. And I'm sure from your own practices, you've, you've seen that uh, psychiatric factors can play a large part in, in patient symptoms. One thing we realize is that functional disorders span medical specialties. Here we have 3PD, but there are plenty of other functional disorders like lobus in, in ENT, chronic daily headache, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, those are all similar types of entities where there may not be any uh, objective findings, but these individuals are suffering. So then if you think about um, it in, in a broad perspective, when a, when a patient comes to you, they come to you with symptoms. And um, as physicians, physical therapists, uh, whatever your training background, we're, we're trained to look at symptoms and try to correlate it with a disease. However, as you're in practice more and more, you realize there are other things that affect symptoms. There are physiologic processes that affect symptoms. There are psychological factors. There are social, cultural factors. So when you look at this entity 3PD, or you could even put anything else in here, sinusitis, you know, um, um, other types of ear pain, tinnitus, definitely. There, 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 there is some sort of underlying disease process that, you know, that, that may be triggering the symptoms, but you have to consider some individuals are more psych psychiatrically fragile and are more susceptible to having symptoms elevated, that an individual may be more susceptible to a fight or flight response. You know, a lot of my patients think that kind of palpitations, nausea when they're having dizziness may be some sign that, that, that they have a new disease. And I tell them, no, that, that's the fight or flight response that's coming from having the vertigo attack. And then social factors, if they're in a disability case and med legal, and they don't even have to be purposely malingering. Some individuals, when they've been on disability for five years, it's hard to imagine losing that safety net of disability and going back into the world and trying to work when you have this horrible dizziness condition. This is where a multidisciplinary approach is so key to treating these sorts of patients. And, and you know, dizziness in general, you, you involve uh, otolaryngology, neurology, vestibular physical therapy is very important. I rely so much on my vestibular physical therapist and, and that can be such a game changer in terms of uh, uh, the patients because these the, the physical therapists see the patients much more often than I do. Um, 
mental health can be helpful, PCT and, and social work. From the neurosymptoms.org website, this is another schematic of 3PD that there is some sort of underlying trigger. And another way to think about it is the brain is hypersensitive. I, I, I say, you know, if you think of your brain as having a thermostat, the thermostat is put all the way up, like 90 degrees, your brain is overloaded. As a result, many of these patients avoid neck movement because movement of the neck and head trigger symptoms, they develop neck pain and headache. They have anxiety, fatigue, don't go out, have this condition considered dissociation. And this is just a schematic showing where medications, physical therapy, working on the neck, trying to desensitize visually, psychological treatment can be helpful. These are some of the ICD-10 codes that I use when I diagnose these patients. Cervical cranial syndrome for the neck-related symptoms, uh, subjective visual disturbances for the visual dependence. Um, I don't really use this one as much, but depersonalization, derealization syndrome. So this concept of dissociation. With functional disorders, many people dissociate. And, and what specifically is that? Well, if in someone's history, they talk about symptoms of depersonalization or derealization, you have to start thinking about 3PD. Depersonalization, they feel strange, floating, disembodied, kind of not connected. Derealization, they feel spaced out, kind of um, not like part of reality. Uh, dreamlike. I mean, those are all clues that, that there is something going on in their brain that is altering their perception of reality and, and triggering some of the 3PD symptoms. So in summary, there is a clear connection between vestibular migraine 3PD just because of so much of the sensory uh, uh, connection between the two. It can be a, a small overlap or a significant overlap in terms of uh, uh, symptoms. And this introduces the concept of a biopsychosocial model where you have to have a multidisciplinary approach to effectively treat patients. And um, in, in the 21st century, I mean, there's definitely more of a push to even alternative medicine, Eastern medicines, acupuncture, because those individuals tend to view the body on the whole, tend to think, that, think of an individual, think about diet. I mean, diet is so important. You, you really can't, especially for 3PD and vertigo in general, you really cannot restrict issues to just the, the particular medical diagnosis. You do have to think about an individual in a more holistic sense. And so kind of a broad summary, my last slide, takeaway point is that, you know, this journey through talking about vestibular migraine and comparing it to Meniere's disease and 3PD, that Meniere's patients have a high incidence of migraine. And so perhaps before doing the, the nerve section, the uh, gentamicin injection, the irreversible procedure, maybe consider migraine treatment. I mean, uh, I, I know a lot of the doctors at the house clinic um, send me their patients. And, you know, it's not a 100% success rate, but if, if a patient finds that Topamax helps them, they're, they're usually pretty happy that, that they don't need to get a craniotomy. More than one-fourth of migraine patients will have some type of vertigo or dizziness. So, so dizziness is very common in patients with migraine headaches. Audiometric changes are the most reliable way to differentiate Meniere's from migraine. As of now, you know, maybe in the future there will be more reliable testing. And then consider persistent postural perceptual dizziness, 3PD, as a diagnosis of inclusion. What I mean by that is it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't have to rule everything else out. Often 3PD is something that you have Meniere's and you have some elements of 3PD. And so uh, you, you always have to be on the lookout, like how much of this Meniere's symptom might be visual dependence, 3PD anxiety. Because if you have a Meniere's patient who's having attacks and you do a nerve section and their attacks go away, they'll be happy about that. But then they may still have some of the visual sensory overload. And, and then yeah, you have to think about how do you, how do you deal with that?
Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.